everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Heather and today I am joined yet again by my mother Joanne. Hello. And I wanted to talk about reading aloud. Mm -hmm. And it's something, it's something I've been thinking about more, I think, seeing my friends now read to their children or stepchildren. And thinking about of course how important it is with with young children and yeah. I think that's fairly universally acknowledged mm -hmm. but seeing especially one of my friends and her stepchildren still reading aloud to them even though they are much older which is something I don't really hear about with mm -hmm. a lot of my other students but it was something that we always did we always did so I thought that we'd do a video about the books that we really remember mm -hmm. either reading aloud to each other or re being read aloud to us. So if we want to go in chronological order, <laughs> we're going to start with you. All right. Reading and breathing, they're one and the same. Um, that's basically how we operate in this house. I am a librarian, so books are very important, but I think think that was really driven home by the fact that when I was growing up, the first place we lived, there was no library. There wasn't any. And I can remember neighbors' homes going in and there were no books in the houses. There were no books. There were no bookshelves. And, but I always had them. Even if my mother and father bought me the little golden books that they sold at the supermarket, I always had books. And my very, very favorite, and I do not know the title, and if anybody out there knows about this book, I would love to know. It was about a chicken baking biscuits and somehow managing to lock herself out of the house and burning her biscuits. It's, it's, I was three, it was my favorite book, and I have searched in vain for this book, and I can't, but I, I can't find it because mostly I don't remember the title. But I can remember reading that with my father every night, and he was getting very bored with it. But and screaming with laughter because she burned the biscuits every night. It was every hilarious. time she got her sweater every caught in the door and she burned, she burned her, her biscuits. biscuits. And at, at three years old, this was the high point of my day. I just thought this was the best thing. Repetition is important for small children, and that's the first story I remember. That and Rupert the Rhinoceros. I remember that one. But then my mother started getting me. So she signed me up for Book of the Month Club, and every month. A new book came. A lot of them were Dr. Seuss, some of them were not, and they were wonderful. It was very exciting when that book came. Oh my goodness, it was the best day of the week, the best day of the month. I mean, we did have a bookmobile um, that came once a month, um, but we were a one-car family, and sometimes we had to walk four miles and four miles back, not uphill both ways and in a blizzard, but it was a long walk when you were four or five years old, but my mother and I were desperate for something to read, and it's my other recommend recollection is that my mother invited some of the other ladies on the block. Why don't we all go to the bookmobile? And they looked at my mother like she had five heads and we were the only ones in the neighborhood who went. And I still find that quite amazing. Um, eventually we got a portable classroom. That was exciting because at least it didn't move and when we had the car we would go and that was fine because it was further away. But I think not having a lot of books made me treasure them even more. And I have such happy memories of reading with, it's funny, my mother bought the books, but I remember reading them with my father, which is really kind of interesting. But his father, my grandpa Carl, he loved children's books. English was his second language. He came from Germany and he loved children's books. He loved Dr. Seuss. He thought Dr. Seuss was a genius. He loved the way Dr. Seuss played with words. And we just had the best time. And while his English was wonderful, all of the articles remained German. And while this is not a Dr. Seuss book, a book that he absolutely screamed with laughter was Der King, Der Mais und Der Cheese. And I will, I, if ever I find it, that is the way I read it, because that's the way it was read to me. It was In this with, house, we cannot say it. We cannot say it any other way. It is read with German articles, and that's just the way it has to be. But it started there with the children's books. And then as I got older, he always loved reading in two languages. He read voraciously. He loved Westerns. He loved Zane Grey. Oh, he loved Zane Grey. That was one of his favorites. But I remember one summer we read to each other. It took us a very long time, but we read all of the James Fenimore Cooper Leatherstocking tales. 
I'm not sure we got to the fourth one. I only remember the first three, and I think there was a fourth one. But we sat on the porch in the heat of the summer, because it was too hot to do anything else, drank iced tea, and we read to each other. And we, what else did we read together? We read a lot of things together. Um, the poor soul was not in good health for most of my life, but we could sit and we could read. And we loved it. And I have such happy memories. And I don't have a lot of books that I read with him. But I was looking around and I found this. This is part of a series. And I think I only had the first three books. But my friend Jill, who had much older sisters, they had the complete set. And I remember borrowing books from Jill, um, this particular set. But it's just a series of anecdotes, short stories, poems, portions of books. Like there's a one or two chapters from The Wind in the Willows in there. It's not the whole thing, but it's when um, Toad decides he wants a car. It's just that portion of it. And there are two stories in there that my grandfather loved, and they were both written by James Thurber. And I remember him reading them to me. And the first is Many Moons. And it's a sweet little story. And, and he loved it because it was so sweet and so gentle and it was very clever. Thurber is clever. And this was the first story that I remember he was, they were there when this book arrived. And of course you started the first story and this was it. And the other one is in there too. It's The Great Quillow. I'm not quite Hold sure on, how far. It. The Great Quillow is a longer story. Wait, wait, wait. Just pause in your thoughts. Okay. There we are. Okay. The Great Quillow is another Thurber that I guess a lot of, I mean, I didn't, you know, I was a kid. What did I know? But this was adorable. This was so clever. And he just, he loved it. And this was sometimes a book that he would request. Why don't we read The Great Quillow together? And it was great. And I have, I, when we, I was clearing out books, and there were some things that, but I couldn't get rid of this one because this had such a happy memory of sitting with him. I can, I can smell his aftershave. It, it's, it's just something I couldn't possibly part with because the memories are so important to me. But, you know, Grandpa liked to read a lot of different things. And... My other grandfather, not so much. He was more of a doer. This one liked to read. And that's the other thing that reading together will do for you. It creates those warm, lovely memories of snuggled together on a cold day or a hot day when you don't want to do anything else and reading together. And that's so important. And I know when my mother was teaching, sometimes I had a vacation and she did not. And sometimes I would go into school with her, and my mother taught first grade, and she had a, a reading challenge. And I was the one that would sit and read with the children. They would read a book to me, and then their names went up on that. She had a train across the top of the classroom, and every child had a railway car, and another book title was and written on their railway car, and it was terribly exciting when you're six. And I sat there one day, and I, swear, I tell you, 17 children read me, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. It wasn't my favorite book at the end of the day, but it is a very sweet book. But I noticed that they'd start next to me, and then they'd be leaning on me. And before I knew it, they were in my lap with two other kids leaning over my shoulder, breathing heavily. It just seemed like they needed the, the, the physical contact as well. And I, I was okay with that. But I did notice that as soon as they got closer and closer and practically in your lap, their confidence level seemed to rise. And I thought that was interesting. So that was one of my favorite things to do. And my mother's friend who was down the hall and her kindergarten, I would sometimes go down and read to those children. And before I knew it, I had six kids in my lap. And it was nice. And I really liked it. And I think that's important too. Yeah, and it helps them feel safe and loved yeah, and, and cared and about comfortable so that then yeah. makes them more willing to take a risk exactly um and then you know when we always read to heather always i mean she was 12 hours old in the hospital and i was reading to her because what else could i do there was nothing which we could do together so i read to her a number of pamphlets that the hospital brought about and her eyes were staring at me like what the heck are you talking about but that's when it started and I always read to her from the time she was a very small person. And shall I tell about the night? You go ahead. Okay. We were reading to her. She was probably six months old. I don't think any older than that. Sitting up, but not really going anywhere. And she was sitting in her father's lap. And we were reading Spot. 
Spot learns his colors. Spot goes to the farm. I don't remember, but it was a Spot book. My favorite books were Spot books. Oh. I will have a picture here. I do have them, but they're buried oh. deep in a closet. Oh, yeah, they're packed away. But anyway, she also had a little dog. Meet Bernard. Not Bernard, Bernard. But trust, anyway, so she's holding Bernard, and my husband is reading to her, and she suddenly, it made sense. Bernard and Spot were both dogs. They were both brown and both white. Bright. And she couldn't say anything at six months old, but it was 20 minutes before we could move on when she made the, the connection, she's patting the book, patting Bernard, patting the book, looking at us like, do you see this? And I tell you, that is the day she learned to read. She didn't learn to read words, but she understood the connection between a book and her life. And that, to me, is reading. That's, that's the bigger part of yeah. reading. Things I learned from doing a year of reading intervention. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. And it's just, it's absolutely incredible. And, you know, I went, she went, we, I took her to her doctor for some childhood checkup. And he said, so what's new? And I said, well... I think she, she figured out reading. And he looked at me like I had, you know, like I was crazy. And I said, no. I said, she's looking at things and she's assimilating information. Is she reading particular words? No. But she's figured it out. He was really impressed. And that was just a springboard for you. And you just went, you took it and you ran with it. Anything with printed matter. We had to read the newspaper every day when you were a small person. Yeah. We had to read the comics every day. Mm -hmm. Dear Abby, if it was clean, sometimes Billy Graham, he was right underneath. Go through all of the headlines. It took us a long time to eat breakfast, but it was important. And what I found, too, is you would then go back to those pages and look at them again. Mm -hmm. Because you were trying to figure it out. Exactly. And I, you know, we always, always, always had books available for her to look at. We always had the sacrificial catalogs with, you know, pictures of Barney and other things. And uh, you, you really loved our first church, um, directory. church directory yeah. because find a picture of Emily. Where's Pastor Mark? And she'd go through the books and she'd look for pictures, and that made her very happy. And if I needed to speak to somebody on the phone for more than five minutes, I would hand her that, and it kept her busy, and I could talk on the phone, and it worked out very well. But, you know, and we read all the Harry... Well, we read the first... Well, no, no, no. no Chronological no, order. Okay. Chronological order. Okay, so where do we go from here then? Oh, well, and then... Probably this one. Well, then. Then came my first absolute favorite book, I would yes. say. Yes, when you were two. Yes. Um, for your second birthday, mm -hmm. my aunt sent her the book Madeline and... Ta-da! My... Over 25 years old, very beloved, and slightly the worse for wear. Oh, poor Madeline. Madeline. <laughs> Madeline, there was a period of time that Heather, Madeline was never without, she was never out of hands reach. Madeline went to preschool, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. I mean, only on the first oh, day. The first day, but, just because, you know, yeah. you might need a friend. And, and, you know, and, and it was, and it was great. Madeline, Madeline's been to Europe. I mean, you know, Heather made her her very own passport. Um, but Madeline, we had to read this every night for close to, oh, well, I guess I'm trying to think you had it memorized. Really? Your birthday's in November. By January, you had it memorized and it looked like she was reading because she was turning the pages in all the right places but that was also the beginning she started memorizing other favorite books and this remained the favorite in all mm -hmm. capital letters along with the rest in the series of course yes but, we have uh, read all of them we do have the whole collection mm -hmm. but you know memorization is also important because it makes i think it made you feel like i can do this mm -hmm. and i always had a book my husband always had a book and she saw us reading so this is clearly something you do for fun, for pleasure, for enjoy. This this is the best thing in the world. To go to the library was a great... It, if we went to the library, it was a great day. And I think that feeling of I can tell a story to yes. somebody else, mm -hmm. that's, that's really huge. It is. Your cousin Kyle loved it. You, you, well, he didn't make you read that one book 15 times. Oh, muskrat, 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 eat your peas. peas. That Ooh, was his boy. favorite... <laughs> Until finally, I remember you glared at him and said, Kyle, I will read to you, but you must find another book. And 
Well, all, all right. right. So he got up and found another book, but he was so Thank excited you. that Heather could read to him. And you were happy to do it. Yeah. So, you know, that was that was a fun thing. That was Yeah, that that was good. And and it's it's important. It made you feel helpful and useful and, mm -hmm. you know, all of those things. Then going on with memorization, you would also read me Poetry. Poems. Oh, I love Winnie the Pooh poems. Starting with A. A. Milne's yes. uh, When We Were Very Young and Now We Are Six. Yeah. And we have, of course, Winnie the Pooh in the same collection. Yep. These were books that my mother bought for me from, not Book of the Month Club, but um, they're, they're very beautiful. And I was very happy to have them so I could share them with Heather. But these poems were other things that I could memorized because oh, yeah. a lot of them are very short and very simple and they're they're okay. very repetitive because they're yeah. marketed at um at children yeah. but again that feeling of i can tell this story to somebody else yes that that's really empowering and that's really cool you entertained an entire bus at disney world you did the king's breakfast <sighs> it did everybody was very excited to hear how it was going to end and uh, yeah, that's all. It's it's wonderful. Um, to be fair, I was reading by then, but still, you were. But you didn't have the book with you on the bus. I did not. No, you did not. And you were happy to do that, and it made you happy. And when you were in preschool, I remember Mrs. Galliano. What a lovely woman! She you would go in and you would tell her things about. Well, I read this wonderful book last night, and it started, and then this happened, and you were able to tell the entire story from beginning to end. And she said to me, she tells me, she, she's every time and then she's determined that I have to know about this wonderful book and she can tell me the whole story from, you know, be, from the beginning to the end in chronological order. And I said, well, that makes sense. I mean, why wouldn't she be able to do that? And apparently it takes children a while to get the hang of that. But I think because we just read all the time, you just, it was instinct for you. It was natural. Yeah. It made sense. And I can remember your kindergarten teacher saying that there were parents who complained bitterly that they were required to read one picture book every night to their child. We used to read three stories to you every night, four if we were drying your hair, because that was kind of boring just to sit there. So we would read another book while we were drying our hair. But And admittedly, if you have multiple children, okay, it bedtime be, is a little more hectic. It can be, but yes. even so have family story time yeah or what my friend's family did was if you have one child who can read mm -hmm. say okay you are in charge of story time read to your siblings have them yeah. pick the book you do story time tonight yeah and that's wonderful because then the younger children are very impressed that they're being read to by their brother or sister in this case it was a sister and they wanted to be like her because i want to be able to do that and that's a wonderful thing, too. Well, they're, they're all readers in that house anyway. They are, but yes. Yeah, well... Because, again, I'm sure they were doing very similar things to, yeah. to us. Yep. But, yeah, I mean, other things that I remember oh, from yeah. when I was very little were things... There were a couple... My father did not want to come on, but there were a couple things that <laughs> he specifically... Yes. had to read. Yes, there were certain things that were just his territory. One of which was this book, because this was his copy. This was his book from when he was little. Right. Uh, your great-grandmother brought it back from England mm -hmm. for him. Apparently there were others, but I have never found any of the rest of them. Yeah. Um, they were all quite cute. Well, except that first one with Child Roland, and that, that oh, one was kind of creepy. Yeah. <laughs> I never liked that one that much. Oh, but we had our favorites. Um, but we had our favorites, such as Findings Keepings with the old lady who keeps finding fairy gifts in the road and yep, that the was various a good one. silly things that happen to her. Yep. I rather liked Kappa Rushes, which I think combined my love for Cinderella and my future love of Shakespeare. <laughs> so yes, that's very much Cinderella meets King Lear. Yep, yep, that's exactly what that was. And then. And then oh, finally, the his favorite, absolute favorite. He had to read this one of the Country Bumpkin, which we have alternately titled "Stupid Boy" because that is the refrain. 
which of course was the best part. Yes. Waiting to be able to yell, stupid boy, every time Jack made another silly decision. Yep. And that was special too, because it was your father's and he really liked it. And I like that one, that's a good one. The other one he absolutely had to read oh, yes. was Paddington. Mm -hmm. He absolutely had to read Paddington, Paddington specifically because of his Mr. Curry voice. Yes. The cry of, bear, what are you doing, bear? <laughs> that, that was another <laughs> refrain that I was just waiting for. Yep. When was Mr. Curry going to twig that Paddington had messed things up again? <laughs> He never learned, did he, Mr. Curry? No. No. Well, neither did Paddington, but no, he, well, lived, he lived in hope. Yes, Paddington. He was trying is, to do nice things. He was a hopeful bear. It just never really worked. <laughs> and then? And then things that we all read together oh. were the Basil Brush books. And Classic. We, we all memorized bits of this one. It's part of family, the, some of the phrasing in this is part of the family lexicon now. And it's just ingrained in us. Um, but this is a particular favorite. And I don't remember how we found these, considering that we couldn't get, we have never gotten the television show here in the U.S. No, we had to wait until you were much older in England to finally watch it. Well, we had to wait until I was 18 to be in England when it had been revived yes. to see it again. No, we found this only because I saw the spine. And I remembered we watched a program, um, Are You Being Served? It's a British, you know, 70s co comedy, situation comedy. And at one point, one character turns to the other and says, well, where do you keep your pajamas? Inside my basil brush. And I thought, what the heck is a basil brush? I had no idea. Never, not being familiar with, this, with the, the television show. And then one day we were browsing and I saw this, basil brush. And I thought, oh, wait, this, this has to be. And so that's the reason I took it out, only because I saw the television show all those years ago. And it turns out there are 10 of them. One we've, is funnier than the next. We've only found a couple. I think we yeah. have about four, four or five here in the house. Please tell me we have the windmill. We do. Oh, good. I love that one. We have one. this one. We have the windmill. We have the beach. Oh, yes. Oh, goes, I think goes sailing. Goes boating. Yeah. Oh, those are my four favorites, I have to say. Those were my four favorites. But Basil Brush is hilarious. He's funny as heck on television because every now and then you can find him on YouTube. Um, he goes to, doesn't he go to um, Glastonbury every year? He does. He always does the kids area at Glastow. And mm -hmm. I always wish that we could go to Glastow, honestly, just to see him. That but, would be uh, the reason I would go to see Basil <laughs> Brush, honestly. Are. Never mind Elton John, we want to see we Basil We want to see Basil Brush, yes. But then what I loved was, you know, those were all books that we started reading when I was, you know, four or five years mm -hmm. old, which I feel like it, it's very common to read to your children when oh, they're yeah. that young. Definitely. But I loved that we kept it up even up till when I was 11 or 12. Yeah. Which I feel like a lot of families stop. But my yeah. richest memories of reading stuff aloud were from when I was much older. I think it meant a little bit more. Well, it was still a cozy time. It was, yeah. I looked forward to every night curling up in your bed. Yep. And reading a chapter of something. something. That's yeah. that's honestly how we read a lot of classics. It is. It's how we did The Secret Garden. Yes. And The Wizard of Oz. And yep. trying to do the sequels to The Wizard of Oz and deciding, eh, not I like, really into these. I like them more than you did. Yeah. Yeah. But then you finding books like The All of a Kind Family, Aunt which Janice, I know... Aunt Janice bought this one for you. Oh, really? Because it was one of her favorites. Oh, okay. Yeah, Aunt Janice bought this for you. As far as I knew, I was the only one who had ever read these. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm on BookTube, I know that Marissa always loved them mm -hmm. uh, when she was growing up. And I know, um, I think Emma at A Bookish Princess and Kate Howe d have discovered them much mm -hmm. more recently. They're lovely. And I love that they're making a comeback, and I love that more people get to share them. If you haven't seen their videos, this is the story of a pretty large Jewish family living in, is it Brooklyn? I think it's Brooklyn. In New York at the beginning of the 1900s. And just daily life, daily incidents that happen to them when mm -hmm. various holidays roll around. How do they deal with that? Mm -hmm. The good and the bad. The Lost Library Book. 
I remember oh, that one. Yes. Oh, that was that was just the worst thing to happen. They lost a library book. Which, as a reader, you totally feel for, oh, you yeah. relate with, especially as a small child, that anxiety of, I've let her down. Oh, no, what do I do? Yep. They're, they're sweet. They're lovely. Oh, one of my very favorites. And then, speaking of classics, being able to read, say, The Wind in the Willows with you mm -hmm. made Love it. it that much cozier than yep. it already is. Yep, definitely. It's one of my very favorites. Not everyone likes The Wind in the Willows, but it's always been a favorite of mine. It's just quirky enough. Well, and what I loved about reading it when I was that much older and reading it aloud mm. is that most of it is pretty straightforward. It's, you know, adventures, messing about in boats, mostly. <laughs> Keeping Toad from making questionable decisions. But, yeah. um... But there's that one chapter where they meet Pan, and then they have to go away, and he makes them forget afterwards. Why don't I remember this? Everybody does, because it's a really weird chapter. It doesn't okay. fit with the tone of everything else around okay. it. We'll have to but I, it. I loved that we read it aloud, mm -hmm. because I then got to ask you, well, why is he making them forget? Mm. And, and you got to explain to me that, well, if you met God, you know, nothing else in your life would feel the same after that, would it? Yeah. So, I truly, I have going to have to read that book tonight. Mm -hmm. Yes. But then, even as I got older, you know, I could have read the Harry Potter well, books on my own. I was perfectly capable. Yes, you were. But I loved sharing that experience mm -hmm. and getting to hear it out loud and getting to discuss it after finishing yep. a chapter and discussing what do you think's going to happen next and yeah yeah that's how we read the first four harry potter books i yeah. didn't read one on my own until the fifth book right and i was a little disappointed but you wanted to go faster yeah and you know reading a chapter at a time it takes time because by that point it was the culture of all of your friends have read them any camp you go to because they always came out in the summer yeah everyone's going to be talking about it. I've got to go faster than this yeah. just to know and not be spoiled. Well, heck, the last one we read with three bookmarks in it because right. I was reading it, Heather was reading it, of course, and my mother was reading it. My mother read all of the Harry Potters because she wanted to know what was going on. And we went on vacation oh, right the, after it oh, came I out. So we were that. just passing it along, around between the three of us yep. on, on the flights. And when my mother had it last and she was carrying it on the flight coming home. We were in Rome. And she's walking up the aisle to her seat, and six people yelled, How does it end? And the rest of the plane screamed, No! Don't say anything! It was hilarious. My mother was quite surprised. <laughs> she didn't give anything away. <laughs> but, I mean, that's the power of a really great book. And so, yeah, I, I don't miss not having had the staying up under the covers reading it, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really glad we, that we read those first couple together, mm -hmm. and that we got to build that yeah. family love of it together. Oh yeah, I love those books. I was, okay, can I talk about this one? Yes. Okay. Not everybody likes James Thurber, but I love James Thurber, and truthfully, um, he's, he's I don't, I, there's, there's nobody else like him, really. And one summer, my husband was away. He worked Monday to Friday someplace, I don't remember. In another state. In another state. And so we only saw him on the weekends. And so we were reading to each other. And I started reading this to Heather. And our very favorite, because we have a couple, but our very favorite is The Night the Bed Fell. I can't read that now without laughing. And Which it, opens it opens right almost up, nearly almost nearly automatically. The after it. That's the car that wouldn't go. Oh, the car we had to push. That one was pretty funny, too. But the night the bed fell was there my very favorite. There it is. It's the one before. There it is. It's hysterical. It's just bonkers. You can't even imagine. He claims it really happened. I, 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 you know. The illustrations are extra yes, good as well. Yes. I think Thurber was someone that never let the truth get in the way of a good story. But it's... I was hysterical. She was hysterical. We roared. And then when your father came home, we had to read it to him. And he laughed, too. Especially that one of electricity leaking all over the house. <laughs> because we had relatives who genuinely thought that. Well, my mother, God rest her, 
Um, yeah, uh, if she liked well, to all unplug her relatives everything. thought it. So what else they was she did. going to think? Honestly, if my mother could have moved the refrigerator, she would have unplugged it at night. I mean, really, she made us all crazy. But that was funny. It so was that, twice as funny for us. Right. That makes the story extra funny. Yeah. So to have it read aloud to you, that's that's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, God, we screamed with laughter with that one. And, and I think that same year, I have really huge memories <laughs> of whenever I was sick. Yeah. Because I remember being sick in February, and then there were those two weeks where I was sick, which was highly unusual. It was unusual. And you read to me bits of Sam Levinson's Everything But Money, which Historical. very few people have probably heard of. Yeah. So he let's was, give some background. He was very big in the 60s. And honestly, I think this is a book that my mother borrowed from the bookmobile. I really think that. Whoops. Uh, no, really. And I, my mother did not laugh. She was not a whole body laugh she chuckle. Whereas I laugh, roll on the floor, scream with laughter, tears roll down my eyes. I, it's a whole body laugh for me. My mother would chuckle. My father was like me. But she was reading this and rolling off the bed. She was screaming with laughter. And I thought, oh, heck, even at five years old, I knew this had to be good. And so she read me the bit about the cockroach. Well, background, yeah. Sam Levinson was, was he genuinely a stand-up comedian? He started out life, he... he well, he, he started as a teacher, He I became know, but... a teacher, and then, I guess, over time, telling stories at banquets and, you know, award ceremonies and different things. He's, I don't know how he gained notoriety, but he was suddenly on the dinner circuit, you know, telling, you know, amusing stories. I don't know if he was ever on anything like, you know, Ed Sullivan or any of those kinds of talk shows of the time. But he stopped teaching Spanish and became a comedian. Um, and th so these are his stories about growing up in New York in the 1920s, 20s. 30s. Yeah, he was the youngest of eight or nine Levinsons. And his father ran a, he had a cleaning, a dry cleaning service. And they led a hand-to-mouth existence. But it was funny. It was his view of it. He said that people thought they were underprivileged, but he never felt like that because he had a very strong family behind him. He had parents who wouldn't accept anything less than his best, who had aspirations for their children that they were going to have a better life. They were going to work hard, mother and father, and the kids were going to work hard because if your father's working, you know, in the sweatshop for 15 hours or 18 hours a day, darn it all, you're going to do your homework and you're going to do it right. And they had that kind of ambition for their children. And he said, you know, plants didn't grow in his house, but books did. He said they always had books piled in corners. And he, his ambition in life was to have a library card that was very well used. Now, I don't know what sort of check-in and check-out system they had back in the day, but his brothers used the library a lot. He said mostly because they had steamed heat and it was nice and warm there, probably. But he said his ambition was to read as many books as his brothers did. And as his older brothers, one became a doctor, one became a dentist, one became, I forget, but they all started, and as they became successful, they helped the next one and the next one helped. And so they were a very strong family unit. And he said he never felt underprivileged. He never felt unloved. He said because he had such a strong family. And, and it's his stories of how they made it through, as he put it. And they're funny. I mean, cockroaches, they're funny. I'm sorry, you have to read this story. <laughs> they're funny if you're from New York, let's put it that way. And they're way. funny if they're not your cockroaches. <laughs> That's the only way they're That's funny. That's the only way they're funny. According to Mama Levinson and my grandmother, who also lived in New York City, they were never your cockroaches. No, they came from next door or upstairs, but they were never yours. You were always getting rid of somebody else's cockroaches. Well, how dare they? How dare they? Your, my house is nice and clean. You know, what are you doing here? Go back to where you came from. Um, no, I, re I remember my grandmother saying, that mm. they're not mine. They come from upstairs. And I thought, oh, okay, what do I know? I'm a little kid. My grandmother told me that was the truth. I believed her, you know? <laughs> They're not your cockroaches, Grandma. But even though I felt absolutely ghastly, I remember feeling really cozy just curling up on yeah. the couch and having you read these to me. It made me feel better. 
Oh, they were and then nice. being curious and trying to sneak this later and read the bits that you skipped over. And I, I was old enough to know you skipped parts. I'm like, why are you skipping that paragraph? I don't even remember why. Maybe I just didn't think they were that funny. I, I but don't know. But it's, it's a book that makes me laugh. It's the only book I've ever seen that made my mother roll off the bed screaming with laughter. Um, she, too, grew up in Brooklyn. So I think, you know, you have to have that kind of mindset and maybe have at least visited to kind of... Or I guess if you've lived in any large city. But, you know... Brooklyn is funny by itself. It just is. And that's what that's part of its charm. And then, and then even last. getting into when I was much older, I was about 12. You were in middle school, definitely. Yeah, I was 12. It was yeah. seventh grade. When we started reading Woodhouse. Yeah. And I think it was because of the show. It was from, yes. I had reached that point mm -hmm. where children's TV wasn't really doing it for me anymore. Yep. But you had to find good relatively clean yeah. stuff it had to be you know suitable for a 12 year old do that again but i but you had to find clean mm -hmm. adult television for a 12 year old yes. and we had just gotten the dvd player so we got the full set of jeeves and worcester ah. so then you dug out this book and we were driving to florida so I think mostly I read to you, and, sometimes, and then when we parked, you read to us. You know, in, yeah. in the hotel room that night. Yeah, I have trouble reading in the car. <laughs> um, I didn't at the time. It's yeah. it's gotten worse as I've gotten older, but it's mm. manageable. But yeah. anyway, um, we just read to each other a lot of the way there and back. So yeah. that's you know at least four days of reading to each other. Yeah, it was great. It's, it's Well, you have to like Jeeves and Worcester, and, and we do. We think they're very funny. Um, but I remember your English teacher was the only English teacher you ever had that we didn't really care for. Yeah. She didn't know who Woodhouse was, and I mean, I didn't expect her to know. You know well, I, I expected her to recognize the name, even if she had never read anything. No, no, that's that's a bit of an unfair expectation. Is it? Okay. Yes. But she's an English teacher. I think... I think it wasn't so much the fact that she didn't know who he was. It was the fact that she wasn't curious about it. She, she really didn't bother wasn't. to ask more or find out more. No. Because my students read plenty that I've never read, and I'm not even their English teacher, but I try to look into it afterwards or ask yes. them, what is that about? And it, she never really did. But... No, well, that that's why she wasn't our favorite. Yes. She, she wasn't curious. She only knew what she knew, and she didn't want to read anything else. I thought that was kind of sad, but, you know, that's her loss. But again, very happy memories of yeah. reading this aloud to each other as yep. well. Yep. Oh, I love Jeeves and Worcester. So mm. all of that to say, mm -hmm. read aloud to each other at any age yep and let me know down below is this something that you did with your children are doing with children in your life or do you have happy memories from your childhood mm -hmm. are are you all adults and you still read to each other let us know yep. in the comments because i'd love to see that it's not just us that a lot of other people mm -hmm. have these lovely memories or yep. If you hadn't considered it, maybe think about it. Yeah. So thank you for joining me. You're very welcome. And until next time, be safe, be well, and happy reading. Bye, Bye everyone.